cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Kate, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, my, my pleasure. It's fun, you know, uh, to be able to uh, actually sit down and have a conversation with you. I feel like the last couple of times we've seen each other, um, it's been at big events. So it's like, hi, bye. <laughs> yes, it has been at big events, you know, at uh, IPNC and then, you know, earlier or later in the fall at, at Salute. It was like, oh, hi, nice to see you. Kind exactly. Of thing. I know. And so, yeah, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking yeah. me. Yeah, no, thank you. And I uh, appreciate you accepting. It's, uh, I know that we've gone through a couple reschedules and whatnot. So I'm glad that schedules lined up and everything is, is uh, going hunky dory now. I know, you know, I think, yeah, we were supposed to meet around Christmas time. And then, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, RSV, all the other things. So it's a real, uh, I'm glad everybody's healthy. <laughs> they can find a time. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, so just kind of starting off, uh, your direction in life, you're going to be like an, an optometrist to, to start off with. Why Why I optometry? Um, you know, it resonated with me because uh, I have really poor vision. <laughs> I, think oh. I know. I um, So I'm actually, uh, I'm a triplet, and I was born... Uh, two months early and um in those days and I'm, I'm not i'm pretty sure they do something similar now but um when you're that premature um they put you in an incubator and because of that um you have this kind of neovascularization of the eyes and your eyes tend to grow in different size shapes so my eyes are kind of the shape of a football um although and so that always kind of stuck with me and so when I was looking at, um, I did my undergrad in biology and chemistry from uh, well, general sciences from the University of Oregon. And um, I was looking at a field where um, I was always kind of future oriented, thinking about like potentially having a family and not necessarily wanting to be on call. Although having worked in the field, um, I know that's not necessarily 100% true, but that was my vision at the time. I was like, I think this would be really great. And so I, um, when I left University of Oregon and I graduated, I started working in the field and started working for a great practice in Beaverton. And they were incredibly supportive. They did a lot of FDA trials. It was a really great fit. Um, and then as I was starting to um, get ready to go to optometry school, I... Um, started working for an urban winery in Portland um, by the name of Hip Chicks Do Wine. They were in our neighborhood. We lived in East Moreland and we kind of just stumbled upon it. And so my husband and I started volunteering and I really, I really liked it. Um, it was exciting. It kind of suited, um, you know, the, suited this idea of creating something, but also having this science kind of foundation. And so, um, I had this moment where I was like, oh, I think I want to look into this. Right. And so that was one kind of facet of how it led me to go to winemaking. And then, you know, my husband, um, back then it was my boyfriend. Uh, gosh, we've been together for over 20 years now, which is crazy. And we Congrats. went on, I know, right? Uh, we went on a um, motorcycle ride. He has a Harley and his, we went with his dad and his dad's friends. And we went, I think we went to like Tahoe and I don't know, Reno. We went all over. But one of the gentlemen on the trip had said, um, I don't even know how we got to talking about it. But he had said, you know, I met this guy and he he called him a grape consultant. And he said he, <laughs> he, said he was um, from OSU or worked with OSU. And travels around the world and eats and eats well, drinks wine. And it was kind of in that moment where I was like, I like to drink wine. I like to travel the world. And um, and so it kind of, you know, the two 
things kind of um, happened at once. And so I decided to look into it. And so since I had already uh, gone, I had, you know, gone to school at um, University of Oregon and um, I was looking at UC Davis, um, but I had my college roommate from Oregon was living in Australia doing her master's in uh, geography and GIS when I, um, and she's like, you know, there's a great program here in Adelaide. You should look into it. And so I looked at the master's program down there and it just seemed incredibly compelling and an adventure to be able to, um, you know, move to Australia. So, um, yeah, uh, I applied and I got in and, um, and then I had to break it to my parents that I was not going to go to optometry school, um, uh, that I was in fact moving to Australia, um, to study winemaking and my parents, uh, you know, both children of immigrants, you know, their metric for success was very different. <laughs> and, um, you know, the classic, right? You, right. you, um, you become, if you're science and you have a science background, you, uh, go into the somehow in research or medical, um, you know, it's a safe route. And so right. they were like, what are you doing? What do you mean? You're just going to move to Australia and do a master's program in winemaking. And I was like, yep. And by the way, we're going to, we're going to get married <laughs> right before we do that. <laughs> Oh my goodness, all sorts of uh, bombs dropping from the sky all of a sudden. I know, I know. So, um, yeah, they were, you know, I mean, I was an adult. Um, so yeah. I just, I was like, okay, this is what we're doing. So it was a little bit of a shock for them. Um, but they, I mean, it's not like they stopped me. They were like, okay, oh, all right, that seems an adventure. Go do it. And so nice. we... Yeah, we got, um, I got into school in December, um, I can't remember, it was like 2004 maybe, and then we got married July of 2005, and we left for um, Australia three weeks later, and kind of started a new life there. That, that is mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. I, I, I'm kind of curious, are there any... Um like dinner or holiday dinners where, you know, you're with your parents and whatnot. And they're like, you know, we never thought that was going to work out, but you know, it, it did work out. Good job. Yeah. I think, um, they realized like I, I, one of my favorite stories to tell is, um, I was speaking to my mom and I was like, Oh, you know, mom, I gotta go. I've got to get up early in the morning. I've got to go, um, like pick grapes for a research project. And um, this was in her in Australia, and she's like, and they both grew up in in New York City, and she's like, oh my God, that sounds a lot like farming. I can't. <laughs> and she's like, yep, that's that is exactly what it is. Um, and we're not just here drinking wine all the time, um, although there was a fair bit of that. Um, but it was such a magical time, you know, two years dedicated. Um, to just studying and thinking about making wine and tasting wine and being in a really cohesive group. There were 20 people um, in the master's program and then um, there was a lot of interaction with the undergrads and we all got together all the time to study and to think about wine. You know, it's at that point where you are, um, you know, so eager and hungry for all of it and so and it was just a really formidable time i think back to that it's like holy cow um how lucky were we yeah. and so um and to answer your question yeah my parents um were they're, they're endlessly proud and they get you know they've always enjoyed wine so um i think they were really um once they realized i wasn't just going there to you know drink wine <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, and that it could be, you know, a career. And so, and that there were, there was maybe was a method to my madness of some sort. But when we got there, my husband was not in the wine industry. Um, he was looking for um, another avenue. Uh, he was working in the printing business here in 
when we lived in Portland. And so he was looking really for any job, but South Australia is pretty insular and it was really hard for him to um, find something. And so a friend of ours, a friend that I was going to school with, she had mentioned to um, Andrew Hardy and Con Machos at uh, Petaluma in South Australia. It's like, oh, you know, my mate Griff has, we've been friends forever, even though we had been there like two months. Um, you should hire him for harvest. And so he got, which is, which was great. He, um, we like to say that we got two educations for the price of one. So um, he went to uh, and worked for Petaluma and he really learned winemaking from um, a different side, not necessarily a theoretical side, but from um, the practical side. And so he kind of got drawn into it that way. And uh that's absolutely amazing that that the two of you did that. And I, I can imagine, you know, the people that you met, you probably still keep in contact with this, you know, to today, right? Oh, we're so close. And even the prof uh, professors in right. um, from Adelaide, it's, it's just remarkable. Like, I think you are there. Um, and, you know, we're all in our 20s. So um, it was just, it was just incredible. Um, yeah, we're just, a lot of us are still in contact um, and what is great, um, that was the jumping off point to having connections all over the world. So within my graduate program, there was, you know, um, a woman from um, Israel. Uh, we had a couple, um, you know, classmates from uh, China and a couple classmates from, you know, South America. Um, there were only four, there are four Americans out of 20, which, you know, was actually a high amount for, um, but all over, like, and only like a couple of Australians in the graduate program, the rest were from all over the world. And so, um, yeah, it's just remarkable. That, that, that is remarkable. And mm -hmm. with your husband being in the industry now, it's, I'm curious, what does harvest look like at your household? I mean, it has to be kind of crazy. <laughs> It is pretty chaotic. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a question I often get. Um, my, I think that was one of the moments of panic when I found out that I was uh, pregnant with our first son is who's now nine, almost 10. And I was really like, how am I gonna do this? Having uh, worked harvest and you know, you spend a lot of hours, um, but my, aunt and uncle um, growing up, they uh, retired really young in their uh, mid fifties and never um, had children of their own and kind of were our, my brothers and I uh, second parents. And so um, I remember having, um, yeah, a breakdown <laughs> to be real <laughs> about it. It was like, how am I gonna do this? And they right. said, we'll, we'll come out and we will help you. And they have done this now for 10 years. They come and, um, help take care of the kids during harvest, which is a huge help. I can't, yeah. it's such a gift. Um, and I think I get that question a lot from other um, women who are in the industry, who are younger, like, how do you have a family and how can you give um, everything to your job and then still do it? And I, I, I guess my advice is like, find your community and your village um, it's not, it may not always be like an aunt or uncle from, um, that can dedicate, you know, three months to come and help take care of the kids, but there are people that will help you. And I think you just have to work, um, smarter and also set some boundaries. Right. Um, so yeah, it becomes easier. Um, yeah, certainly I as they get older, but it is, it's madness. But I think a lot of times, um, throughout you know, the 10 years since we've been doing this with children, um, my husband and I, Griffin, we've worked out a system where, um, you know, somebody can take them to school and if we need help, somebody can pick them up, but we can kind of switch off. And I think that's right. the benefit of communication um, with your employer um, and just in your team. Um, and, but there's also a lot of moments where the kids are with me um, at the, at the winery right. and and that is i think really great i think um they get to see 
what I do. They get to um, be a part of it. I actually now pay them to come sort great. So uh, <laughs> once my oldest is very into it, he's doing some pump overs this harvest. Um, awesome. But I, I like that they see what I do. And it's not just this idea that like mom goes to work and we don't see her for, you know, 10 weeks. It's more like, okay, they're involved in the process in some way or another. Um, and my youngest, William, I had right before um, we started like four and a half weeks before we started picking for sparkling in 2016. And so um, Stoller was just so amazing. They were like, okay, you know, he <laughs> was strapped to me. And um, I think our interns that year got a, um, <laughs> got a lesson in holding newborn babies um, in addition to, uh, in addition to learning, you know, our techniques for winemaking, because it's like, okay, I need to go pee, hold my baby for a second. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, so it, I feel like it's valuable. Yeah, no, it is very valuable. And you've been very fortunate throughout your career. Like, you know, you worked with Anna Matzinger at Archery mm -hmm. Summit, you know, and yeah. a lot of other women. And, mm -hmm. you know, you are, you're setting quite the example yourself out there you know, in, in the community, you know, as part of women in wine, and that's just mm -hmm. quite a, uh, quite a path that, that you're putting out there. So, you know, congratulations for that. Oh, that's, that's really kind. I think, um, yeah, I think when I um, joined women in wine, it was really important for me to um, pay it forward. And I, like you said, I've been incredibly uh, lucky and very um, supported by um, a lot of women in this community. Um, and I'm in um, not only from, you know, Anna and then Melissa Burr, who was like, and I think one thing with Melissa, she um, really set the tone for being able to have a family um, at Stoller. And um, I think that was really important straight away. And I think about that now in um, a role that, can you know usher um my team if they when they if they decide to have a family um but you know um it's about again um communication and setting realistic expectations and i um but now going forward you know there's still only about 20 percent of women in uh decision making roles um in the valley certainly in the wine making um and there's i think even less in you know, the very top in terms of, you know, presence and um, of organizations. And so that was what really drew me to Women in Wine. There's still work to be done, but um, because I've been so incredibly supportive, supported, it was time to give back and create space and, um, you know, help with the momentum of Women in Wine. So, yeah, I think another part of it, you know, I'm in a tasting group with Anna and Matt Singer, uh, Shell Francis, Louisa Ponzi, Lynn Penner Ash, Wynn, uh, Peterson Nedry, and Gina Hennan. And it started off as like, I think we called it like a, um, we call it like, we call it, I don't even know, tasting group. It's had many iterations. Um, but we wanted to, and we even did like a tasting for women in production um, to have a round table to see, you know, what the issues that women are up against today. You know, when I was first working at Archery Summit, um, I was going to unload a truck and um, one of the drivers were like, is there somebody else can, who can do it? Even before I stepped on to the forklift, and I was like, excuse me? No, that would be me. Um, and I'm, I was wondering, and we had talked about it, and I know that, like, um, the other ladies in my taste group had faced kind of similar uh, prejudices and um, or preconceived notions, and it kind of hardens you a little bit. I was like, is that still the case? Have we progressed further than that? And there was, there was some talk. I think um, there's a lot more women getting into the industry, and so we wanted to create a forum to see what they faced and i think that one of the one of the issues i think was like again how do you have a family but i don't think that um 
<laughs> like women can't drive forklifts or, you know, fix heavy machinery or anything like that. I mean, honestly, I can't fix heavy machinery, but I know who to call if I need to fix it. I can rewire a plug. <laughs> well, and I'm sure that, you know, if you really wanted to, you could probably fix heavy machinery if that's. It's true. Yes. It's true. I can figure it out. Yes. But yeah, no, there's, um, there's still room, but for improvement. And so I think, um, just providing resources. I think what drew me into women and wine is that it was actionable. It's like, let's, um, uh, figure out how, you know, we can get more women in the room to, and men allies, um, uh, to provide networking so people can talk to each other and then also the resources and the information. And so, yeah, it's still, um, it's still growing. And so now we at Women Around Wine have the mentorship program, which is really great. So it actually um, pairs a couple people together um, a couple times a year. And then you have the opportunity to form relationships and, um, you know, have really great, meaningful interactions. So yeah, yeah. there's, there's so much happening. There is so much happening, and it's. I think it's a great organization. But I'm. I'm curious. Is there any um, up and coming superstars that we need to be aware of? Oh goodness, there are so many up and coming superstar superstars. Um, I think um, there's, you know, Julia Presto at Ponzi. She's doing her own little sparkling label, um, and she's. She's growing. I think um, there's a lot of really thoughtful women in the industry. Um, I mean, Cho Wines, I'm sure you've seen mm. them out there. They're doing great yeah. things. It's a husband wife team. Um, yeah. I'm envious of their marketing. <laughs> They're doing <laughs> so many great things. Uh, but yeah, no, I know it will come to me, but there's um, so many wonderful women that are um, shaping the landscape right now in the Lambeth Valley. So oh, yeah. well, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that, you know, that will break, will break, um, maybe parody. I don't know in the next 10 years. We'll see. Yeah, no, that, that, that would be absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be great. Um, I, I think you've said something in the past of something like, uh, being a gym, a Gemini, you have like a million things running around in your head and, you know, you're a collector <laughs> of ideas. <laughs> Yeah. You know, are there two or three things of, you know, ideas that are currently floating around in your head that you want to share? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I think there's always ideas. Um, when I think what benefits me as a, um, as a Gen Gemini um, and is that I mean, you should see how many tabs I have open on my Chrome browser right now. It's pretty amazing. But um, maybe <laughs> it's that we we have the ability to take and process information um, from all different facets. So constantly thinking of like, I don't know, anything from like what we're gonna cook for dinner tonight to the kids' schedules to um, you know, we're getting ready to bottle. Um, I don't know. I, at this moment, um, because it's earlier in the week, I am kind of in survival mode, but there's a lot of things rattling around. Um, I'm programming chair for women and wine, um, which, um, co-chair now I have the lovely Meg Ordaz who's helping. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about, um, I kind of go to sleep thinking about what are the hot topics? that um, we are looking at for 2023. And um, always, I'm always looking at like the news and the media, um, trying to see what voices we need to amplify. Um, and so that's kind of percolating right now. And it, I kind of like this kind of cocoon time. Um, I think also as a Gemini, I tend to overbook myself on a regular basis. Oh no. <laughs> um, I, it's it's great. It's just how I operate. Um, whereas my husband is a little bit more like, let's just stay in. And it's like, no, we're going to go here and we're going to do this. And then this weekend we're doing this. Um, and I've really leaned into this slowing down in January. Um, in fact, I'm doing a damp January, pretty close to dry. But um, and so it's been good to sit and 
kind of incubate and think about um, everything ahead of me. Um, And that I feel like um, is something that I've gotten a little bit better at as I've gotten older. Um, But yeah. Yeah, I, I can only imagine it's there's always a million things going on and just to slow down for just a little bit is it is nice, but you know, at mm-hmm. other times it's it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I mean I think I'm just now uh thinking about what's ahead of me in the this upcoming year and it will be um yeah, really great. Um we're doing a lot, we're kind of settled into our or wines that we're making at Stoller um, and just looking at working with the vineyard, how we, uh, uh, we continue to farm that, those sections and kind of bring uh, these wines, um, continue to elevate them. And so it's nice that we've kind of established a portfolio. And so yeah. it's, it's a good time to be reflective. And then also, um, I over vintage a lot of wines. So this is the time where we're bottling and getting ready um, and then moving into, we'll move right into um, taraging in the next few months. So um, uh-huh. already we're like, oh goodness, looking at the calendar, like we're going to have to start thinking about blends um, in the near future. So, I, yep, it goes fast. It's, it, it, so are, are you getting making any plans in there you know for for travel because i know that you have like i think you have like our Ar- Ar- africa and antarctica on your on your bucket list of places <laughs> to travel i mean i wish Ar- i was going to um um antarctica or africa um not this year i am going to france i tend to go to i try um to go to a uh, champagne tasting every year in uh it's called terry Vaughan. It's an ounce, and uh, it is um, remarkable. You taste uh, base wines, Grand Claire, um, and then the current release, and it's in the Cathedral d'Anse, and it is just um, remarkable. I started going with a friend of mine who lives um, in over there um, and who is now in the kind of distributing side in France for Grower Champagne, and she was an intern actually here in Oregon in 2007 and we became very close. And so um, one year in 2011, I was working um, for, uh, I was over there for about a month um, working with Kariakos Kiniakos, who's a French consultant that I've had the great pleasure of working with and working um, for in over the years. And he, as it happened in 2011, um, if you recall, there was a massive Icelandic volcano <laughs> eruption that pretty much paralyzed uh, the air travel. And right. so we uh, we got um, I got stuck over there. And so I just stayed with uh, my friend Marie Pascal, and we I don't know when she knows pretty much everybody um, in, uh, the champagne region. And we just went to tastings. And as it happened, there was the second tasting of, um, kind of collective of this Terry Vaughn tasting that was put on by, you know, Georges Laval and, um, um, Agripar and, um, gosh, there's so many. Um, and it was kind of this forum where they're like, we need to bring trade to this region. And there was, and it was in a smaller hotel in DZ. Um, and of course, um, like Peter Liam was supposed to be there, but he got trapped in, in New York because of the volcano. But he was pretty, he's very close with my friend Marie. And, um, you know, because I was still trapped there, he finally made it back. And I just remember drinking uh, one night, drinking, you know, spark or champagne bottles without any labels. And he's like, oh, I think this is this producer um and i think it's this and it's from this and this tastes like this and then she would kind of look at the bottom of the cork or do something she's like oh my god of course of course you would oh. it's just so it was one right. of those you know four o'clock in the morning nights where you're just like this is this is you know one of those moments that you can't forget 
Yeah, no, it's so, just, it's, un, yeah, no, it sounds like it's completely unreal. That's fascinating. It was incredible. Um, I cannot, I, I mean, I would love to be able to tell and grow our champagne in that way, um, but I don't, I don't have that ability. Um, not yet anyway, but I, I go to this tasting, or at least I try to every year um, in April. So I'm going to go do that. I'm going to uh, pop over to Burgundy and um, see Kariakos and see some friends. And, um, and then I'm going to uh, go to Italy to see a friend who's uh, shooting a cookbook at the moment. She's a food and wine photographer. And so she's doing um, a cookbook in the Alps. And so, and oh, yeah, good. that's, that's the only thing. I was going to ask, when is that cookbook coming out? And like, what, what are the details? Um, so the cookbook is coming out, I believe at the beginning of 2024. It's okay. been, um, it is um, by an author, Meredith. Um, she did, oh my gosh, I should know her last name. Um, she's remarkable. She has a cookbook that's already come out. Um, I think it's Alpine Cooking. Um, she lives in... Um, Northern Italy. Um, she's, I believe she's Canadian and then she's, um, been living. I think she married a, an Italian gentleman and, um, has always been an amazing, um, chef. So the first one, um, I'll send you the link. It's just gorgeous, yeah. but my friend has always been, um, a part of the production on that. So yeah, yeah. I'm excited. And then other than that, yeah. who knows? I think, um, oh. I don't know what else the, the rest of the year, I'm holding space for, um, you know, some, some weddings that I've heard inklings about. So <laughs> right. we'll see. <laughs> so are, as you're traveling over to Burgundy or France and whatnot, are you keeping track of like the, the farmer market schedules to make sure your, your car doesn't get trapped in? <laughs> I've learned, I've learned my lesson. I've definitely learned my lesson. That was, uh, such a funny, such a funny moment, a moment of panic. Um, but in true French fashion, you know, the market went on um, and just like surrounded this cute little Peugeot. Um, I did find that picture the other day. So it is so funny. Yeah, I do. I, I've, I've definitely learned my lesson. Um, unfortunately, um, yeah, <laughs> I try to park way out of the way these days. I can, I can only imagine. So, I mean, locally, are, are there any certain farmer markets that, that you like to attend and go to? Oh, I'm, we're fortunate here in McMinnville that um, we have a great farmer's market. Um, I believe it starts um, in the spring. It's on Thursdays and it goes to, through October. Um, so, yeah, that, I usually yeah. go there. And then we're uh, also in McMinnville. We have Mac Market. And they have mm -hmm. even pole farms, which is a local um, farm that provides incredible produce. And they um, keep the um, the refrigerator case full of all of the um, all of the you know produce from there. So um, right. we're so lucky out here for in McMinnville and in the Willamette Valley because if you need um, and you're inclined to shop for fresh meat and produce, um, you don't have to look very far. Yeah, yeah, well, most definitely. We are very, very fortunate. Um, I have to tell you the other, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks ago, I was out and about on uh, Alberta Street and mm -hmm. just on a whim, there was a wine bar and I uh, went into the wine bar and, you know, uh, as I walked in, the person behind the the, the bar was uh, Pierre and he used to be the, the tasting mm -hmm. room um, guy at uh at Holleran. Mm -hmm. and i was like oh hi pierre how you doing and you know then we got to talk and and then i looked at the wine list you know by the glass was your mm -hmm. 2018 dolores pinot noir and i'm like oh, holy cow that. two coincidences <laughs> in the same spot that's just that's amazing um but your label call me dolores can you tell me mm -hmm. like what was the inspiration behind it and kind of you know where yeah. are you going with it um, so yeah, we, um, my husband and I started this project, um, about, I guess it would have been at least in 2014. So a while ago, and uh, we started making Pinot Noir, um, and, and also a little bit of sparkling. Um, 
And it's really taken a while to, for everything to come to fruition, being the, having this be kind of our, um, I guess it, it, it right now, it's a side hustle. Um, it's something that we would love to see grow. Um, but, you know, we really wanted something that was, you know, a combination of both of us. And so um, the 2018 is from the Open Claim Vineyards. And um, we we really just enjoyed that vineyard a lot. And so, but as it happens about the sparkling, um, we were asked, I guess it would have been in 2015, to share an acre of Pinot Gouge Blanc um, with, you know, Chad Stock. Um, at the time, it was owned by Dr. Zelko. Um, and so for Zevo Vineyards, um, and then uh, Drew Voigt took some of the Pinot Gouge, and then they're like, "You should, you should take this, you know." You, and then we'll all put it under our, our own labels. And um, and then my friend um, Andrew Smith was like, "Oh, of course you should make sparkling." And I was like, well, I should make sparkling. Yeah. You know, and then Griffin and I was like, it's just money. Let's just go <laughs> ahead and do it. And um, and so we did. And um, of course, it takes a, a little bit longer uh, to <laughs> to to create a, um, traditional methods of sparkling wine. And so, you know, ours came out a lot later than everybody else's when we're trying to all co-promote. Um, but it's just been this wonderful project. It also took a while to arrive at the name. Um, and as it happened, um, I was kind of thinking about different names and much like naming anything um, with a partner, it's incredibly difficult. It's like naming a child. Um, although we did not have the same kind of deadline <laughs> that we needed to uh, when we were naming our children. And um, I came up with the name Dolores for a number of reasons. So. Dolores, um, well, one, when we were getting ready to design our labels, um, my mom passed away in 20, the end of 2016, and um, rather suddenly, and I knew I wanted something that was kind of, that uh, resonated with both her legacy and with mine. And I, I remember this story of when she was traveling and living in Spain in, I think it was 1974. Um, my godmother is uh, from Spain, and so she was over there visiting her family. And um, for I think a good portion of the summer, and um, and traveling around. And my mother's name was Charlene, um, Charlene Payne. And because you know that name just didn't resonate with the family, um, they started calling her Dolores. So Dolores meaning pain in Spanish. And so it was her alias. Um, so when I was thinking about that, I was like, well, you know, my name is Kate Payne Brown. Payne is still a big part of my identity. Um, and it was also this idea of, you know, having this alias, having this um, kind of alternate personality of sorts and um, the sense of adventure and kind of finding something new. And so that's how we decided to name it Dolores. Um, and it's, it's been great. You know, we make, um, you know, we have a vin non vintage uh, Pinot Gouge Blanc and a vintage right now, 2015. We're going to have um, another vintage of Pinot Blanc or Gouge Blanc coming out. Um, and then we're also getting some Chardonnay from the Pearlstead Vineyard in the Ola Amity. Um, and then we'll see where we go with that. Right now, we're only making a total of, you know, two to 300 cases. So it's not a large amount of wine, I think, um, in order to see it grow um, and really have um, somebody dedicate more time to it, um, that will be a conversation in the future. But I'm enjoying having it out there. It's it's fun to see people's response to it. Um, right. I've firmly planted my flag in the sparkling wine world. You know, a long, t a long time ago, uh, when I first left, uh, um, my graduate program was like, you know, I just want to, my husband working for Petaluma, they focused on sparkling as well. And I was like, I think I just want to make sparkling wine. And there was, you know, an air of condescension when somebody was like, oh yeah, yeah, sure you are. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and um, like, you don't understand how expensive it is or how hard it is. And I was like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm up for a challenge. 
Um, but it is. It takes a lot more resources. It takes a, more time. Um, but I feel like the end result is incredibly rewarding. So I'm here for it. I'm ready. Um, and I really enjoy making sparkling wine. Um, and I really enjoy drinking it. Um, so we'll see where it goes. I think the, the story is still being developed and I'm, I'm hopeful for the future. And I'm really hopeful for, you know, the recognition of Oregon sparkling wine. You know, I think it's a hot topic at the moment and there's a lot of people getting into it and there's just so much um, potential in the valley for it. So there, there's, yeah, there, there is, there is so much, but I, I want to go back a little bit. So Pinot Gouage, is that how you say it? Pinot Gouge. Gouge. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Gouge. So sorry. That's so, okay. If I remember correctly, the story behind it, there's like, what, like an acre or two somewhere planted of, of Pinot Gouge and, you know, you got roped into it. And then you also mentioned Andrew Smith. Is that the, um, I'm, I'm, I was trying to look up notes. I couldn't find it enough, but is, was that the former winemaker at Antiquum? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. He was okay. working with Andrew Voigt or with, um, Drew Drew Voigt. Voigt at the time. And um, yeah, they were getting fruit from there. So there was actually, I love like the full circle moments, but um, these cuttings were taken as like the lore goes. Cuttings were taken from Henri Gouge's property. So Henri Gouge, I think, recognized that there was a mutant amongst his Pinot Noir and he propagated it on his property in Burgundy. And, um, and I, I mean, I believe he did this um, maybe in the 50s and cuttings were taken and I could be completely wrong with that date um, but cuttings were taken at some point and planted at Arcus um, at Archery Summit at the time and then when Arcus was pulled out all the white wines uh, white varietals were pulled out um, before that happened cuttings were taken from that planting and planted um, at the Zivo Vineyard um, and so that's kind of how that worked. And, um, you know, I had never heard of Pinot Gouge and, um, they were like, oh, it's really cool. We should all split this. And I was like, I, again, I'm always up for an adventure. Let's do this. Right. And right. so, um, yeah, it's such an interesting, interesting varietal, um, it's a little bit more minerally. It's not exactly like Pinot Blanc. It's kind of got this. Um, sometimes has, you know, this not green as an underripe, but this greener characteristic. Um, and I was really fortunate because, uh, Lee Bartholomew was farming that, who I worked with, um, at Archery Summit. So, um, and then, and Lee and I had the great pleasure of working together for over six years at, um, Archery Summit. And so when I found out that she was farming, uh, the Zelko, the Zivo Vineyard. Um, and I was like, well, I'm going to make sparkling out of this. And um, let's let's leave it cropped um, pretty heavily. And then sure. let's leave a lot of leaves. And she's like, all right. She's like, your section's the easiest to farm. <laughs> so, um, and so having her there um, really kind of solidified the idea of, that we should do this. And um, we did, and it was really wonderful to be able to work with that fruit. And um, yeah, she just made it really easy and possible <laughs> for that right. in that world. Um, but yeah, and it was just really, I think it was Andrew who was, when they were looking for a fourth to split the acre, um, he was like, this this is totally you. And so I definitely credit him for um and which I didn't, I wouldn't have thought of that, but I'm glad right. he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that is awesome. And it sounds like he's doing his, you know, just recently left Antique Womb and is mm -hmm. doing like vineyard management or something now. If I if I heard I correctly, um, yeah, he's doing some sort of consulting. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, he's doing great. No, that, yeah, mm -hmm. no, that that's awesome. I'm glad to hear it. Um. I mean, you have so much going on, uh, I'm, I'm, but I'm curious, you know, as I was going through all your stuff, so do you, you and your husband take Harley rides anymore? No. I mean, we still have the no. Harley. 
Um, but it, it became a little bit uh, difficult once we had kids. So I feel like it's yeah. harder to do anything um, at the, the, in the same moment. Um, so no, I think he still enjoys writing it, but um, there's just doesn't present the opportunity as much. Um, and so we don't, we don't do it that often. We, um, we are a winter sports family. We ski a lot and he's always been a surfer. So he's, uh, trying to get the kids into that. Um, but no, it's not, it's not as prevalent as it used to be for sure. That's fair. I mean, with everything that you have going on through your head and you're constantly thinking of stuff and ideas, mm -hmm. you know, are you thinking, you know, 20 or 30 years down the road of what kind of legacy you want to leave for, for your two boys? I mean, I, some, <laughs> I think uh, one of them wants to be right now. He says he wants to be a winemaker, but I think it's because the winery always has snacks and the forklifts are cool. <laughs> um, and so I, I would like to leave them a legacy of, you know, we've been so fortunate in um, building a community and connections without, throughout the wine world um, globally. And so I would love it if they wanted to go do harvest somewhere and um, hopefully Dolores will still be around and bigger and then they can uh, take over that and have some ownership in that, even though, you know, there's, it's incredibly hard to have, um, a winery and a wine brand. Um, and you, so you have to really love it. Um, I right. wouldn't want to pigeonhole them in any way, but if they do love it, I would love to leave them, um, some sort of lasting, um, legacy of sorts. So we'll see. I mean, they're still so young. Um, right, right now, um, my oldest wants to be a professional soccer player thanks to Messi and the world cup. And so uh, I'm great, great. Right. My youngest wants to um, be a veterinarian um, slash rock star. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, but I would, I would like to leave a, a legacy of some sort. So, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, no, I, I can only imagine you've, you know, you've set quite an example of being able to, you know, travel the world, see a bunch of places, you know, still keep in contact with people, you know, over multiple, multiple years. And, you know, just kudos to you for everything that you're, that you're doing and setting such an, a great example for your two boys. Well, that's really kind. You know, um, I think I, I love connecting people and places and ideas. And um, yeah, I think that is one of the most rewarding parts of, you know, being a part of the wine industry. I mean, having, making a bottle of wine and crafting something and having that story be able to be told over multiple vintages, multiple years, like opening a bottle from 2016. And I can think about, you know, having um, my son William, you know, strapped to me at that time. It really is this time capsule. And so I love that part of it, but I also like the sense of community. And I really like the, um, I really, um, enjoy this idea of traveling and talking to people about what they do. And there is, there is such an amazing, um, well, back up. I think winemaking draws an adventurous spirit. And when you tie that to the land and the community and the um, culture around it, there's so much to learn and explore. And, um, I think as winemakers and people in the industry, we're always learning and everything yeah. is so dynamic. So, um, yeah, I look forward to the future. I think there's a lot, there's a lot to, of a story that still needs to be told. I, I totally agree. Uh, I have some rapid fire questions and then, you know, we'll get Ooh. you on your day if that works. Okay. That's great. Uh, favorite artist to listen to during harvest. Oh, it's changed. I think though, I do have this playlist that I made when I was at archery summit that, um, songs to ferment to, and it's got a okay. lot of like Al, Al Green on it. Um, Barry white, you know, um, and we did all, you know, native ferments there and follow, brought that over to Stoller. And so I love putting on that playlist. Um, although these days, um, 
I'm, I, I have less and less control over what gets played in the winery. And I feel like um, each year um, there's a new group of interns that feel really strongly about one type of genre of music and that's what gets <laughs> played. Um, and I'm like, great, whatever, whatever keeps everybody motivated. But occasionally I'll slip in my, uh, my songs to ferment too and it brings back a lot of joy. I can only imagine. Uh, mm -hmm. Your favorite indulgent food? Oh, goodness. Um, I love food. Uh, I think my favorite indulgent food, um, I don't even know that it would be indulgent, but I think a really great sushi omakase um, paired with, you know, some incredible wines. I, I, I think it's indulgent in price rather than, <laughs> than like calories, but um, yeah, I love that. Okay. Uh, your harvest notes, are they di digital or handwritten? I've moved to digital. I write everything on um, my iPod with a Apple pencil and I use the, um, my everything, I use Notability um, and that way I can file it a different way. You know, I had volumes of notebooks and it was just hard to keep track of. And I find with my brain thinking about a lot of different things at once, um, you know, it comes with age to figure out the way to like better work with what you have. And I really like, and it was actually Julia Coney uh, who was like, you should try this. And I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. And uh, so yeah, all my tasty notes, all of um, my notes throughout Harvest um, are digital. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Oh my gosh, I'm asked that all the time um, oh. by my kids. They're in that. Oh. They're in that. Um, I think if I could choose a superpower, um, it would. Um, I always, I think it's it would be to fly because I. Um, I'm always racing from one part to the other, so it would be really helpful to be able to get to places faster. Yeah. It's just completely practicality. Um, although, because I, um, I would, you know, to be able to swim underwater and, like, you know, go uh, scuba diving without needing, um, you know, oxygen would be incredible as well. That, that would be so, yes, that would be, it is very serene underneath the water. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a favorite superhero? Um, do I? I think, um, well, my oldest is going through the Marvel Universe at the moment. And so um, we just went to see uh, the new Black Panther um, over the holidays. And it was just such a great movie. I mean, truthfully, I grew up with, you know, as I said, I'm a triplet, I have two brothers. I grew up reading comic books um, and in the Marvel Universe um, and DC with them from a pretty young age. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to be able to go share these movies with my son. Um, but I really enjoyed uh, um, the Black Panther. And so I guess that would be my favorite at the moment. Okay, very nice. And the last question is, um, what was the last book that you read? Um, I have been on an audible kick lately because mm -hmm. um, I can be doing something and reading um, a book or listening to a book at the same time. And um, the book that I'm almost finished with is Michelle Obama's All the Light We Carry. And it's the perfect book to start a new year. Yeah, I've heard amazing things about that book. Mm -hmm. Really, really it's good. Incredible. Things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then I'm... Uh, my oldest son uh, likes to fall asleep to books, so I've been listening to uh, revisiting the Hunger Games and Harry Potter with oh. him. So it's good. We've reached, yeah. we've moved on past the Disney phase, so it's it's been fun. That's that's awesome. That's great. Well, yeah. those are that's all the questions that I have for today. Is there anything that you'd like to bring up or ask me or anything? No, you know, this is great. Thank you for making it, um, you know, so uncomfortable to sit down and chat. I knew it would be, so I really yeah. appreciate it.
yeah, no, I appreciate your time. And again, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of, out of your day. So thank you so much.